welcome to the Right Now Show. I'm Charlie Redner. And I'm Judy Saxon. And this is a program where we put the emphasis on writers, writing, and the arts. Hey, and Judy, Charlie, I want to know how you're doing. Busy. It's been a busy summer, especially... You know, since the last show, you said yeah. you were eating a lot of potato chips and making a list of things to do that you never got to. I know. And I'm failing miserably. <laughs> because I'm getting, I'm buying all these books because I've, I've become a news junkie again because there's so much going on in the world. So I'm reading and I'm gardening and I'm not tackling my long list. Oh, but, how are you but, feeling though? You feel okay? You upbeat? You're doing all right? Perfect. Perfect. And I am walking a little. And what about you, Charlie, the busiest man in the village? No, I just keep doing, as long as you're a writer, you can always keep busy. So I keep right. writing and writing. Yeah, and, right. Uh, well, I am up. so excited about our guest today, Charlie, Leo Rossi. And let me tell you a little bit about him. He's an actor, a producer, and a screen, well, he's a screenwriter, an actor, producer. Oh, let me mention some of his movies. Heart Like a Wheel, which I watched the other night, and I loved it. And I watched again, Analyze This, that he's in with Robert De Niro. Love that. Uh, Halloween 2. Uh, Relentless, The Accused, oh, on television, Frasier, which is one of my favorites, A Murder, She Wrote, Hill Street Blues, ER. Welcome, Leo Rossi. <laughs> well, um, thank you for that intro. Um, every time you would say, you know, a role that I did, you know, in the past and whatever, yeah. I, I would think about my waist size. Oh, for that <laughs> role, I was 33. Yeah. Oh, this one, that was 38. Oh, damn what did i do you know that's the way actors are a little bit of vanity but um the career uh you know i just tried to from my point be the best actor i could be i studied over a period of 16 years oh i'd love uh, to ask oh, about it's, that. yeah i really put i paid the dues so whenever i go on a set i don't care if i'm working with bob de niro or a beginning actor and i can work with directors i know what I know and oh, yeah. and when you're in that situation you don't have to put pressure on yourself you don't have to try to be good you just got to try to do the work and then everything will take its course you know how do you uh, uh, how do you yeah, start child. a career when you're born in Trenton and you move to Philadelphia that's so far away from Hollywood you can't get further away um terrific question because that's the be all and end all of where I am now Oh. Um, I went to uh, I went to Villanova University on a football scholarship, right, right. which means I didn't study. I skated through. Oh. I yeah, I graduated deuces wild, two point two two, and then afterward. Um, you went to law school, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. I went to law school for one year, uh -huh. and I still don't know what a damn easement is. I, I don't know. No. <laughs> It's it's it was I'm not a um, I'm not a, a I don't like conflict. OK, <laughs> and come on in law school. That's what you got to be, you know, right. and uh, I broke my father's heart when I dropped out. But I went into business with him uh, in the environmental uh, environmental recycling, ecological refuse business. It's a nice name for the garbage business. Ah. Um, but really, we manufactured compactors, containers, trash truck bodies, all of those. Oh. And it was a very lucrative business um, because you can have recession, depression. You still got garbage. Yep. And as, as my father, God bless him, he had on the side of the trucks, your trash is our cash. Oh, I love it. <laughs> so if I got a sense of humor, it came from him. But uh, at 58 years of age, um, never sick at his, not only was he never sick a day in his life, he was never in a hospital because he was born at home. Oh. And he was watching Johnny Carson. And there it is. Bye bye. Uh, just oh. had a heart attack. Um, I was 20, 27. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we would we, talk every day. My best friend went away and I lost my mother at eight years of age. Oh, dear. So, you know, it was. Um, and now I said, you know what? And I was going through, uh, you know, a marriage that wasn't working. So um, 
I just, I'm going to do what I want to do. Now, I was a disc jockey in college. Okay. So that's a little bit of it. And you might ask, uh, you know, well, why didn't you do theater in college? Because when you're on a football scholarship <laughs> and you do a play, I know all the football players going to be out there. Hey, Leo, hey, how you doing? Yeah. No, no, I wasn't going through that. But David Rabe, a wonderful screenwriter. Yeah. And David Rabe. He was the head of the theater department. I could have shortchanged my career so quick, but uh, I didn't. And then I came out and I went, um, uh, you know, I still had my father's business and I slowly just liquidated it. And then I started doing little theater. Uh, in Philadelphia, it was called the Rising Sun. It was the Abbey Theater on Rising Sun Avenue. And it for me was I always liked the end. The end is money. But the means to the end, I went, this this is it. And it was great. I mean, uh, I, I had some money in my pocket. In fact, uh, we did quite well, sold the business. And I go to New York, and um, I was driving a, a Oldsmobile Regency, top of the line, everything. And I got into an acting workshop. And... <laughs> Was that yeah. the Lee Strasberg? Yes, uh, yes, it was the Strasberg uh, Institute. Yes. It's such a, I mean, what an honor to get accepted. I would love to know that whole process. That's wonder. What an honor. Did well, you audition to get into that? Is that what you have to do? Yes, but, you know, I had gone, knocked around a little bit going on cattle calls, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And right. Um, I, I knew where I wanted to go, and it was Strasberg. It was the Institute on 13th Street. Right. And some of his students, I mean, my goodness, James oh. Dean, Marilyn Monroe, Dustin Hoffman, you can just go on. Al Pacino, Al Pacino everybody. Pacino. Yep. Yeah. Um, and, and, and it was very interesting because when you go on cattle calls, um, and I really didn't have my craft yet, right? And they say, oh, you need a resume. What the hell? I had four plays in Philadelphia, you know, at a little community theater, albeit a community theater that every Friday, Saturday, Sunday night, it was in a Jewish community and they packed the place. Mm -hmm. They packed the place, 600 every night. So crowds and all that stuff. But um, I, I put a bogus resume. So uh, he's the director go in to see him. How you doing? And you know, he waited an hour to get in. And he goes, I'm looking at your resume here. Um, I see that you did uh, Clifford Odette's Waiting for Lefty. I said, yes, I did. Yes, I did. He said, and you have that you played Lefty. I said, yeah, yeah. He said, that must have been very difficult. I said, oh, it was tough. It really Lefty never comes in. That's what the whole play is. They're waiting for Lefty. <laughs> Needless to say, I didn't get the role, right? But when I got into um, to Strasburg, Mitchell Nestor, he was his right-hand man. I had to go through him. Oh, okay. Mitchell saw that I was older and that I really, I had a goal and I was willing to sacrifice for the goal. And, and everything like that. Um, so Mitchell got me into Lee. And and with Mitchell, it was so funny because um, every after, you know, Lee's class, I got in and the kids, they were from Oklahoma. They were from really? all over the country. And, and I was older. And after the class, they didn't have much money. They were all working two, three jobs, waiter, you know, a del messenger delivering on a bicycle in Manhattan. You can imagine that, right? So I would take them to the beef and brew. Oh. And, you know, and we'd have uh, 10, 12. And the bill would come to $100. That was nothing to me at that point, right? Um, and one kid, after, you know, a period of time, he uh, said, he was from Oklahoma. Leo, can I ask you a question? I said, sure, sure, Jerome, anything you want. He said, are, are you like a hitman or something? <laughs> of course, I drove a beautiful car. I come in dressed like the to the nines, and it was like, oh. I said, no, 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 that, that's not me. Um, it, it turned out I played a few. But, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. So uh, Strasburg did not, and my wife was his secretary uh, on the West Coast. I didn't know her at that time. Um, 
But Lee uh, with the uh, the social amenities, yeah. no, that was not his thing. It was not his Did thing. Do you have any classmates that uh, have had a decent career out there after you uh, went to oh, Hollywood? My God. Um, yeah, th- there were most of the classmates, because it was the actor's studio, even though you had the Strasburg on the West Coast, too, but it was uh, the actor's studio where Lee spent all his time after that. You know, he didn't teach at the Institute. And, oh, they had so many, you can't... Um, <laughs> one time they had a session at the actor's studio, which I was allowed to sit in on. And um, Rita Gam, do you remember the old-time actress Rita Gam? Yeah. Well, uh, Shelly Shelley Winters was running the workshop at this time. Oh. Lee was back in New York. And <laughs> never forget. Um, Shelly was rough around the edges, mm-hmm. uh, direct, and that's all euphemistic. Because this girl, she would just kill. And she had one you know, actor make his entrance and exit eight times, nine times. He wasn't getting 10 times. And then finally, Rita Gamp said, oh, Shelly, come on, g- g- give the young fella a break. And Shelly turned to her, don't make me start on you. All right, Rita, put a zipper on it. I went, wow, this is it. This well, is it. I but, remember um, you said, uh, hearing it, uh, watching one of your interviews, that at the Lee Strasberg, the, the students were not the audience. They, they weren't supposed to be the audience. They couldn't laugh. They couldn't clap. Absolutely. That was his thing. This, yes. was, this was a work progress thing, and, and it wasn't about uh, the students weren't there to be entertained. And, uh, you know, the actors, plus, no, what Lee said was what it was. And uh, from him, I went to Peggy Fury, who was, she was just wonderful. In that class, there was Sean Penn, Michelle Pfeiffer, ah. uh, Bruno Kirby, uh, right down the list, some really wonderful wow. actors. And then I went to, um, oh my God, Milton Kitsellis. He went to, uh, oh, in, he went to the, the famous, uh, acting school in Pittsburgh College. But but he, you know, there was a lot of people in show business went there. And Milton, Milton was by and large a director. Mm. See, Lee wasn't by and large a director, nor was Peggy. So Milton got right to the thing where Peggy maybe would do three scenes in an evening and maybe, you know, Lee would do two over a four or five hour period. They'd work, you know. Oh. Milton would do six because oh. everything, come on, let's get it, let's get it, get up, go, oh. go, go. I mean, he was the type of guy when, um, you know, I said, and I got really close with Milton. Uh, they've all passed now. But I, I, I said, he said, how you doing? I said, ah, my weight. I'm uh, trying to, you know, I, I put on weight, you know. He said, stop eating. <laughs> okay. Did that school last, what, an, a year? Was that a year program? And then you went off to Hollywood? Uh, no, in New York, I was there for three three years, living in Brooklyn. Very interesting. Um, took the F train in. You know, people worry about subways. Uh, you know, the most terrifying time on subways is three in the afternoon when really? the kids get out of school. Because no. they they will they will fleece you they will take everything really? off yeah yeah midnight you got a guard a guard security guard on every cab you know yeah. but um just yeah to so go back yeah. to Lee Strasberg for a minute because I'm so fascinated with that with with him and his, his teaching when you would do a scene would he critique you right then or was he very verbal with his comments and was he encouraging or it's it's interesting because sometimes he would and sometimes he wouldn't say much and and then maybe you would do three scenes later uh-huh. and he go all right all your attention is here it's in your cheeks your top it's stopping stopping all stopping all the emotions stopping all everything wow didn't say anything for three weeks. And, you know, three classes, and he hit it right on the head. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. It was uh, was enlightening. Look, 
The guy was, he was the best. Okay. And uh, Kitsellis, wonderful. Peggy Fury would make us do the classics, you know? And um, she would pick uh, Eugene O'Neill, okay? And for two months, everybody in that class did all of Eugene O'Neill. Oh. Then she'd take Chekhov. Mm. Here, I thought Chekhov was this heavy, Me heavy. Too. The Chekhov, was it? <laughs> it's funny. Chekhov's funny. If you really get down to it, it's a dark comedy, every one of his pieces. Oh. You know? I didn't realize that when I had to read it, so thank yeah. you. For, uh, yeah, yeah, no, it's like, uh, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, so I mean, it was a good, it was a good background. Um, like, you know, theater is like the distance running, maybe the five thousand meters. Making a film is the hundred yard dash. So what you have to do is do that. So when you come to the 100 yard dash, you're in shape, you're ready to go, and you can deliver. Hey, Leo. Yes. There was a school in Philadelphia called the Bessie V. Hicks School of Dramatic Arts. And, yes. And um, a lot of, man, Bruce Stern even went there. But what happened was all those guys went to New York and started doing plays before they ended up going to Hollywood. For some reason, that was the train went from New York to Hollywood. Yep. And and that really was where they were getting their stars and their talent, you know, starting with On the Waterfront with Brando right. and everybody. And it, it just, um, uh, you know, yes, there are wonderful productions now on the West Coast in, in L.A., mm -hmm. but you still run into your vanity productions mm -hmm. where an actor, actress has the money and puts themselves in the lead. And, you know, uh, that's the way that play goes. And maybe they're totally wrong for the lead. Maybe they, uh, you know, but it's their money. Uh -huh. And if you want to do the play and they book great theaters. So, um, yeah, that's a little bit of a problem. But, uh, yeah, I, will theater ever be back? I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't, yes. Well, our movie's heard. coming back. That was a question that came up the other day. Uh, we were talking to somebody that's involved in a movie. I guess it was um, we were talking to Jamie Ford, who wrote uh, On the Corner of Bitter and Sweet. Right. And they were in the middle of production. And he said he learned this new phrase about, you know, an act of God. Production stops and nobody can do anything about it. Will they come back to the theaters once we start production again? Uh, well, it's, it's a mystery. It is a mystery. Um, and, you know, I, I certainly hope so. I, I enjoy sitting in a darkened theater, you know, and having that experience. Sure, sure. Right. But how if, did you, now, how did you wend your way to the West Coast? Uh, it was interesting. My, uh, my dear friend, which we did um, Tennessee Williams Camino Real in New York together, and um, he came out because his brother was in show business. Uh, and his brother went to the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts, Michael Lerner, wonderful actor. And Kenneth Lerner, his brother, uh, he would come out, and uh, it was like uh, he came out, and he, his first job was Rocco Malachi in Happy Days, one of the two Malachi brothers, right? And, and he would say, you know, come out, come on, come out, and I was you know, divorced, footloose, fancy free. I said, well, why not try it? And I came out never came back. Uh, <laughs> never went back. Yeah. Um, it, it, New York is, is terrific. Will New York ever be New York again? Because oh, the one know. thing you have I, I, is people live on top of people. They well, just, they, there's no other way. You hit the streets, there's a crowd. Or yeah. there was a crowd. I have a lot of friends that are moving upstate New York. Really? Getting rid of their place in Manhattan. Huh. And that was what unthinkable was your, before. What was yeah. your first big uh, break in Hollywood? What movie did you break into that you felt you had arrived? Uh, well, you mentioned Heart Like a Wheel. Oh, mm -hmm. loved it, loved yeah. it, loved it. Yeah. You know, it's, and, and the premise is so great. It's, um, it's a girl making it. A housewife. And, yes, a housewife in a man's game, which... Right. He's drag car racing, and yes. it was it was very interesting because the director, um, I had done a little uh, role in a movie called Mr. Billion with uh, 
Terrence Hill, the Italian actor, and Valerie Perrine, and Jackie Gleason. And I got a few Jackie Gleason stories. Um, so it was called Mr. Billion. Uh, it did, did do well. But this director, Jonathan Kaplan, did another movie called White Line Fever with Jan Michael Vincent. And that did well. So he gets a chance to direct a bigger film. So uh, he said, look, um, the first two roles, the character of Shirley Baldowney and Bonnie, uh, Connie Coletta. That's Based her on mother. a true story. Based I mean, on a real true yeah, story. Right, right. So it was like, um, I want, I'm going to have these actresses read with you. You can go to their house or if they have a fly out from New York, go to their hotel room and you read both the Connie Coletta part and you read the husband, Jack Muldowney. Right. I said, okay. I mean, believe me, I was reading with some heavyweight actresses. The one thing was, uh, Jonathan always threw a scene in that he, you know, that they didn't prepare. That was his thing, right? Oh. And most girls would go, uh, oh, okay, he's in the, and, you know, he said, don't look at anything. You know, you read the script. You know, Leo will stay with you. You know, he'll take you where you got to go, right? And, okay. Most of the actresses did it. Not Susan Lucci. She said, that, and Jonathan's mother played her mother in All My Children for all those years, right? So he, she said, can I just look at it for a second? He said, no, 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 just, just, just a second. And he goes, well, okay. She looked, she went, zoop, zoop, okay. She hit every comma. I mean, I guess from the soap operas, you know, you memorize so much every day. She had the uh, uh, photographic, not photogenic, photographic memory and everything. So um, when the readings would go for the girls, you know, it was like all the producers heard me reading the other roles. And when we got to the final callbacks for the girls, he brought somebody else to read for Connie Coletta, the second lead, and he kept me reading for that, that you know, Jack Muldowney, the third the lead. Husband, the husband of us. And his, yeah. his whole thing was, he didn't want them to hear anybody else do Jack Muldowney. And as we got toward the end, the only person in their mind to play Jack Muldowney was me. You were so, wonderful. Oh, um, so good. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you. You're kind. I appreciate that. True. Um, so it's so one of my favorite been, movies. And you met I her. I asked, are you saying that um, after that movie, did you start doing the uh, the heavies, the Italian heavies and those movies? No, no, because uh, first of all, in that movie, I was, you know. Oh, yeah, I know that movie. Yeah, yeah. And then I played, no, not really at that point. Uh, yeah. I start playing detectives, you know, which are, they come. Um, yeah. But it was really interesting because I think up until my fourth year that I play a Italian, you know, I look how I look and I can put accents on, but where really it was a defined mafia character, right? And you get pigeonholed and I tried my yeah. damnedest, you know. I did a, a thing with Corey Haim father and son bank robbing team called fast getaway and i played a shit kicker you know and oh okay i played a a, a kicker okay oh that's but, okay <laughs> yeah it's uh but yeah because on podcasts i can rock and roll yeah we're, we're yeah. g-rated here but yes yeah, so that's all right on. but um you know so I, I always tried to strive to do something you know but hollywood loves to pigeonhole you they love, you know, and, uh, but as long as I, you know, you keep fighting and doing that. And um, the the interesting thing is everybody has slumps in Hollywood. I yeah. don't care who you yeah. are. And when they weren't breaking down the door anymore, um, I said, oh. and, and I talked to my friend who's a wonderful screenwriter. And I said, you know, he said, look, if you're willing to, be with me. Um, I think because you're an actor, you know dialogue. Um, because also, you know character development. Right. But I will teach you the one thing you need to know. And I said, that being, he said, structure. The formula. Yeah. yeah. 
98% of the writers, he said, in Hollywood don't know structure. Mm. And this guy won an Oscar. Ah. So um, I listened, and I still don't have structure down yet, but I'm trying. And um, I did, uh, you know, but I also learned, I thought actors were at the bottom of the barrel. Yeah. Writers are. Writers way down at the bottom Sad, yeah because i mean now this is sour grapes so i all already identified this is sour grapes because this is the way it is in hollywood um i spent three and a half months with john Gotti jr after he came out of prison to write his life story not john Gotti senior this is his son right? this is the son yeah and uh you know it was really interesting because um you know, he was facing uh, five lifetime sentences for three murders and all this stuff. And as I got to know him, you know, there was, because a lot of A-list writers were up for that. But I knew the producer, and the producer liked me and all. And uh, it was a situation where you had to move to Oyster Bay, Long Island, and you had to live there for until that script was done. And you met with him every day. Every 10 pages I had to turn in. Now, wow. You think an alien. Did he have approval of the pages? Was he? Oh, yeah. Like, oh, oh, oh. And uh, like he would say things like, I don't know why I did this, but I'm Leo. Um, you know, I would turn in 10 pages and he goes, All right, look, yeah, yeah but that, that, that's stupid right there. That... All right, John, <laughs> let me deal with it. Come back another 10 pages, you read it. Yeah. Ah, that's dumb. Right, I guess, okay. All right. Did you get caught part. between a director who was probably hired for the project? No, no, the director writer. wasn't hired yet. Director oh. was not hired. So then he say this, uh, oh, another 10 pages. Oh, that's, that's ridiculous. I said, John, let me, let me just tell you something. I said, um, if you were another writer talking to me like that you and i would go down in the alleyway and we would settle this you don't talk to people like that he goes hey that's the way i talk <laughs> so that was it he never did it again really really and i went home to my where i stayed in the apartment and i went Ooh. <laughs> I tamed the I tamed the lion. No, I could have ended up in a dumpster. <laughs> yeah, you could have. <laughs> yes, you know. In fact, my my good friend Joe Pistone, you you, you heard yeah, the uh, podcast, yeah. the real Donnie Brasco, the real life Donnie Brasco. He called me and uh, when I was doing that, and he would say, uh, "We should yeah, say who, right. jo who Joe Pistone is. He's yeah. he." Uh, was undercover with the FBI for six years with infiltrated the mafia, right? He put 220 some mafia members in prison with his testimony. Wow. He was uh, a, a member um, and he was going to be a made member of the uh, Bonanno crime family. Mm. And uh, he one year he only saw his wife three times and his kids. <laughs> Amazing. So if this guy is with you on Christmas Eve, on Easter, anytime, they believed him 100%. Yeah. And uh, it was a sacrifice. He lived to tell about it. He, he's an American hero. And yeah. he really, with his testimony, the heads of the five mafia families in New York, uh, they went away for 100 years. And it's a hundred year sentences that, and the hierarchy has never had the power because of him since then. You know, Leo, when yeah. I listen to the podcast and I get this feeling, he says early on, he woke up every morning with one thing in mind is to stay alive for today. I mean, can you imagine waking up every morning and your only goal is to make sure you're alive at the end of the day? Uh, not for this cat. You know, not for me, you know, and uh, he would always, uh, he, he would always um, chide me. He said, when I was under deep cover, he said, there was no cut. Let's do yeah. it again. Right, it right. was it, right? But he called me when I was working with him and he said, um, so I uh, hear you're working with the kid. And like I said, Gotti had just gotten out four months before. 
Uh-huh. And he thought, and I said, yeah, yeah, I am. I am. Yeah, you're writing with him. Yeah. Yeah. You're still an actor? Joe, of course, I'm still an actor. That's what I started. Always be. Yeah, yeah. Don't you actors need uh, demo reels? He said, yeah, well, what's the point? Yeah, we do. He said, don't spend no money. He said, there's enough film on you at the bureau that you don't ever have to worry. <laughs> so I was being videotaped all the time. Really? Yeah, and I remember seeing Vans and this and that, because and, they thought he'd go right back into the life. And he really? did. He, he did. did not. He's got six children. I know his wife well. Um, you know, we exchange cards and, and everything. When I'm in New York, we go to dinner. Um, he uh, he wasn't cut out, you know, for that. He went to New York Military Academy, and he went to, to the same school, Trump, Trump Coppola, went. the head of uh, Barnes and Noble, and um, the head of the boxing team and everything like that. But in the end, um, he wanted to go to West Point. And how'd you like to be the congressman to sign for a Gotti? Uh huh. Didn't work out, and he went into the life, and the rest is history. But then Nick Cassavetes came on board to direct. He changed the script. He made it a bloodbath. And then uh, Barry Levinson, he didn't do the rewrite. This uh, uh, James Toback did. And he made it. Um, uh, he made it all about John Gotti Sr. All he had to do was go on the TV. And you see, uh, and Armand DeSante did a movie about him way back. It was terrific. And... Mm -hmm. And then they had a Joe Johnston came on, and then the fourth director, Kevin Conley, and they had a 26-year-old girl doing the rewrites. And because, because Gotti wanted me to play his father's bodyguard, who also became John's, you know, until he was murdered, um, Bobby Borelli, he wanted me to play it. He stuck to that. So I got to play it, but the producers told me, when you're on that set, all you are is the actor. Don't comment on the script. Don't comment on the writing. Don't do anything. Mm -hmm. Wow. Tell, tell us about well, I was that. I watched that movie and my uh, constructive criticism was it was it was too fast paced. There were too many characters coming and going. I it was very hard to follow. Uh, <laughs> it was for me. So if it was for you, <laughs> you know, and uh, <laughs> um, I never had a character, the character of Gotti look at the camera. No. What? I never had that. Um, yeah. I never had real news footage of the oh, yeah. real John Gotti. Right. Well, you're, you're sabotaging Travolta. You, you can't see the real guy in that. You can't do that. Maybe at no. the end of the movie you yeah. can do yeah, that. Yeah, at the end of the movie you show those lives. Yeah, yeah. And, um, oh, it, it's like I had pages that really went three, three pages, three and a half, four pages. Nice scenes that you worked hard yeah. to craft. Right. And that, they're all two-page scenes. Yeah. Bing, 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 you know. Uh, it, it be, yeah, but that's, that's, hey, I got paid, and uh, I didn't have the power uh, as a producer to intervene. And yeah, say, you, told a, you told a funny story about Travolta and the air conditioning. Can you, if you can clean it up a little, can you repeat that story? <laughs> <laughs> clean it up, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> what happened was... Uh, I am playing his bodyguard, his driver, and John Travolta is sitting in the front seat with me, and in the back, his consigliere is Stacy Keach. Stacy Keach was playing that role, and uh, and he's sitting in the back of me. So what you do in filming, and David probably knows this here, is if you're doing, and it was going to be a drive down a winding road. Um, now you gotta match the backgrounds. So he thought for expediency to mount the camera on the passenger side, which was Travolta side, right? Mm -hmm. And get a two shot of Stacy and I, or maybe one get me, then get him on the next drive around. Cause what you gotta do, you drive that at five miles, it was maybe a little less than that. And then you got to turn around and come back to point one, do the take again, come back. Right. And, do, and it was about 100 degrees and 100 degrees humidity. Oh. And so what would happen is when we were doing the drive back, we had that air conditioning blasting. I mean, it was blasting. And we would get back. So we shot it. Now they have to remount 
on the, the driver's side to get Travolta. Okay. So they do that, and we go to start the car. Uh. Uh. <laughs> oh, sorry, the battery's dead, right? Oh. Right? And they said, oh, John, uh, you know, with the air conditioning, we can tow it. And John said, uh, just could you put the, uh, all the phones on, all the department heads? I specifically told all the department heads this is an older car and that we should have a spare battery there. I did say that. Yeah, John, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And here we are, a big scene for me, and no battery. <laughs> and they said, yeah, yeah. He said, okay, I'm just making a point. So he does. Now we, we're off. And uh, it was like I waited 30 seconds. And I winked at him. I said, yeah. And he turns. He said, yes. I said, what you really wanted to say, you stupid bitch, you no good for <laughs> motherfucker, you pop, boop, pop, beak. And, and he goes, yes, yes, I did. <laughs> but he was a gentleman. And it was so funny because you couldn't put hair and makeup in there. No. So he was sweating so profusely, I had to put my arm up at, and I'm dabbing John Travolta's face, you know? <laughs> oh, Lord. Oh, but uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's all the things. Uh, he turns out to be a swell fella, and my heart is very heavy for him right now. Yeah. He lost his wife, right. and she played his wife in the movie. Uh, great gal. Great gal. Yeah. Gal. Yeah. 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 Uh, tell us about the story, the story with you auditioning. Uh, for Analyze This with uh, Robert De Niro, where, well, anyway, I'll let you tell the story. Yeah, no. uh, so Harold Ramis, the director, uh, we lost him, wonderful guy, uh, Ghostbusters, everything, um, he wanted me. Now, also, Billy Crystal played on the same softball team as me, right? He wanted me. And I tested and everything like that. But in the end, Bob De Niro had in his contract, he approved all of the mob guys, mm -hmm. all of his crew. So I knew Chaz Palminteri well, but you don't call Chaz and say, to tell Bob, you don't do that. I said, yeah, let my agent handle it. Let's see what he comes up with. So, um, okay. He said, listen, they just started filming. I said, well, I'm dead. No, 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 you're not. Um, Day after tomorrow, they want you to fly to New York, fly your first class, you get to New York, and um, you know, uh, you're gonna read with Bob. In his lunch break, he's gonna read with you. And I went, hmm, okay, all right. So um, I said, okay, let me be smart here, because I know that they're gonna throw an improv scene in. So I, I was on the flight, I was going to, you know, memorize my character's relation with all the other characters that he encounters. So whatever, you know, I'll know the background of that guy, this guy, that guy, and whatever direction De Niro wants to take it, you know, it'll be this way. Well, I get first class, and they have the three seats in the, in, in the middle, you know, two seats on the side, and sitting right next to me is Fabio. You remember the Harlequin novel guy and all the cover? This great looking guy with blonde hair down to here and everything. And, and he's reading uh, mechanics magazines, right? <laughs> so, you know, before you take off, it's like, okay, um, the stewardess comes by and, and asks what you want to drink. It was like I was Casper the ghost. I wasn't even sitting there. she go right over to him. What would you like, Fab? What would you like this? Thing? this? And I went, oh, then we get up in the air. Same thing's happening. I'm going, am I here? Right? So I said, I got to stop this. So I said, uh, you know, I'm sitting now. He's reading. And I go, no good. Shut up, bitch. Now I can hear him. Like just, I can see out of the corner of my eye. He's just like turning a little bit. So he goes back to reading, and I go, no good, dirty, but now he starts, looks a little more, right? Another 30 seconds. I get rotten, you chick, put back. And he goes, hey, senor, uh, everything okay? I said, no, not everything's okay. I wanted to be the best looking guy in first class. <laughs> 
And he starts laughing and laughing. We, we hit it off great. Uh, I thought you gave I, him a script and asked to play a part while you were rehearsing. <laughs> oh, no. No, his accent was a little too <laughs> off-putting, you know. Too authentic, right? <laughs> yes. And so when I get to New York, um, I went right to the hotel. They said, drop your bags off. We're bringing to the set. And they bring me to the set on 55th Street in Manhattan. And they were going to break for lunch. And at lunch, Bob and I were going to meet in his trailer, you know. And Harold was going to be there. And Ellen Chenoweth, the casting director. And that was going to be it. If he gave me thumbs up, I was going to get the role, right? Right. And uh, so we're in. And Bob comes in. And he smiles. Hey. And he points up. <laughs> And I look up, what the hell am I looking at, right? And he's smiling. <laughs> you sound like him right now. <laughs> he goes, oh, yeah, yeah. You know, I look. He was pointing up to, in the middle of Manhattan, on his big, big, you know, RV, he had, a, had them put like a little tree that I guess he felt like he was in the woods. <laughs> okay. All right, Bob, right? So he says, you're going to start? Yeah. Now... The first scene, we're reading back and forth. He's not even looking at me. Not even looking at me. Okay. I mean, he's saying the words, but not much emphasis. All right. Second scene, eh, maybe he gave me a few glances. But there's no connection. Mm. Wow. So I'm going, all right. So now Harold Ramis says, uh, okay. And I knew Harold wanted me. So well, let's, uh, you know what, let's, let's do uh, an improv here. And I said, Okay, but uh, I got to tell you, Paul, uh, Jelly, whatever he was before, he ain't no more, you know? And De Niro looks at me because Jelly was his best friend in the script. Right. And De Niro looks at me. He said, don't you worry about him. Don't worry about him. I said, well, I'm just saying, you know, Paul. I didn't say Bob at the beginning. Yeah. I said, well, okay, uh, but Paul, I got to tell you, now he knows. Now he was right there with me. <laughs> Before I got back to the, the cab that was going to take me back, Thumbs up. Got the part. Oh, yeah. great story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And hey, Leo, uh, um, before we run out of time on the show, there's two things I wanted to talk about. One is sure. the podcast, and then I wanted to talk a little bit about the Canvas Dancer. So let's talk about your podcast, if you can tell me okay. how that got started and what it's without, all about. Without a doubt. Um, uh, first of all, I didn't know what a podcast was for a long period of time, right? Uh, right. Then I heard all these outlandish amounts of money that Joe Rogan is making, right? Oh. So it's uh, with podcasts. So I said to Joe Pistone, Donnie Brasco, I said, Joe, I played you in a one-man stage production, which I did in Chicago. Did. And we actually moved it to Atlantic City. It was called The Way of the Wise Guy. And I played Joe Pistone. And um, it was like, I said, you and I hit it off. He said, yeah, I trust you. And I said, I trust you. I said, is there anybody that knows more about you than me? We've produced three movies together, one television movie. We've hung out together. Families are, are very tight. I heard every one of your stories 10 times. <laughs> and he goes, you son of a... Yeah. I said, why don't we really... All the interviews that you've done, I want them to know you. And we can break chops, to, you know, and, and have laughs and still get to the heart of what you did. Yes. And, and, and exactly, you know, and it's going off the charts. One thing I learned about podcasts, it's length, length. The basketball player has length. He's got a long reach, right? No, mm -hmm. it's when people tune in, how long they stay on. Oh. And we were at like 97%. So we knew the content was there. Mm -hmm. And we finished our first season. You can see it on, you can hear it on um, Spotify, all the Apple podcasts, uh, jamstreetmedia.com. You can hear it on that. And it's, um, I think one of the, not only do we get down to really knowing who this American hero is, Yes. We, we have laughs, but some things came out that I wasn't, 
I never knew that Joe Pistone quit the FBI. Oh. And then, well, I don't want to give too much away, but yeah, and we'll, we'll get into that in the second season. I see. The first 15, and we have guests coming up, uh, a warden, and it's the other side of the coin. And this guy was a warden. He started out as an assistant at Lewisburg Federal, Federal Penitentiary. Pennsylvania. Went to Tur uh, Terminal, uh, Terminal Island, uh, Joe Woodring, right? And, and Joe and I had a great time because that was th the other side of the coin. And yeah. one thing Gotti told me, Gotti Jr., he told me the BOP, the Bureau of Prisons, oh. is another country with different rules. Really? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, hey, oh, before we go further, um, you go to your favorite platform to listen to a podcast. What actually do we look for? The title of the... Oh, oh thank you. Thank you very much, because Joe would have kicked me in the butt. Um, it, what you do is deep cover the real Donnie Brasco. Deep cover the real, the real Donnie, Donnie Brasco. And uh, that way, you know, you can get it, um, like I said, Spotify, uh, Apple Podcasts, and uh, the company that's behind us, Jam Street Media. Yep. Wow. I've been listening. Very, very insightful. Very interesting. Wow. It's actually Thank scary you. to listen to, isn't it, Judy? I mean, I'm nervous for him knowing what he's up to. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, you, you I really am. I'm serious. This is yeah. scary stuff. It's yeah. Uh, real. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He, um, I, I don't know how he did it, really, I because know. He's, I know. he really is. And you get to see it toward the end, the end of the uh, first season. You know, we, we, we joke around and you see he does have a sense of humor. Um, uh, you know, I always tell him not much, but no, he's got a great <laughs> sense of humor. But uh, he, um, he knew, he really knew that if he had to put on a character to behave like Joe, what you see there as Donnie is the same as Joe. So he said, why would I want to try to, he said, I grew up in Patterson, New Jersey, around wise guys. My father owned a bar. I know, I know the streets. You know the lingo. Yeah. yeah, I didn't want to have to put anything above that because, you know, uh, being a, a jewel thief, that's what I said, how the hell did, and he said, I said, but you had to learn jewels, yeah. He said, yeah, and anything else do you think I had to learn? I said, well, jewels. He said, how about uh, alarms? Got to break in to get there. How about opening a safe? Uh, uh, I said, you know how to do all that? He said, yeah, he said, maybe I'm a little rusty, but whatever. And then I know he was, you said that. The yeah. two things that he didn't learn that he wished he had learned, you know, as a as a bad guy, was something about art and the value and where to get it and how to oh, steal yes. it. And the other was white collar crime. I don't know anything about white collar crime, you know. Yeah. No, no. See something, guys. And, and and the mob is in that hook, line, and sinker. <laughs> you know, they really are. Uh, when I went to Sicily, um, to where my grandmother was born in uh, Bugadilla. Bugadilla is about 13 miles outside of Palermo. And Bagadilla, okay, is this, the county seat of the mafia of the 10 families in Sicily. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we stayed, there's the princess, uh, Vittoria Aliata, and uh, she has the Villa Valaguanera. And 54 rooms, that's where we stayed. Her father was a prince. When he died, the mafia, she was, as a, a journalist in the Middle East, they took the property. And she started campaigns and this in the paper, on the news. And I said, Give a, you know, I, you, you're going to get killed. You yeah. know, it, she says, they won't kill me that way. No. She said, They'll kill me the other way. I didn't understand. All the mafia bosses, their sons, they made them go to the best business schools in the country, not in Italy, in the United States. Right. All the law schools in the country, the best ones, right? Harvard Business. Yep. They came back, so they control the law, they control the politics. She said, they will tax me to death. Uh, 
Um, I want to ask you one question, Leo, about how you actually do the podcast. Are you in your house and, and uh, Joe's in his, or do you? you well, know, it was, it was, do do that? it's a good point. First eight episodes, Joe was four feet from me. Okay. okay. Joe was four feet from me. Um, and it worked beautifully. And we were bunking together and uh, we would go back to the studio and we did the first eight episodes in three days. Okay. Oh, wow. And a shout out to my, uh, we stayed actually in this apartment by Frankie Borda. You know, uh, it's uh, Franco Luigi's Italian restaurant right across the street. And we stayed, <laughs> we ate well. But um, <laughs> then when COVID comes, Joe is um, in a location where if I told you, I'd have to kill you. No, I don't want to know. No. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I'm out here in Temecula, the wine country in California. Okay. And that's the way we're doing it. It's not by our choice. We would rather do it uh, the way we did before. Yeah. But uh, this is the way everything. You audition for a movie right here. It's, you right got to put yourself on tape. No more auditions. And I can remember when auditions, I mean, but I kind of like it in a way because you can do it again and again until you're happy, right? Oh, right. I mean, when I would go in for an audition, uh, play the tough guy or something, I go in. I didn't want them to see, you know, nice, happy Leo. All right. I would go right in. And, oh, can we start? Yeah. yeah. Boom. And I had one. Boom, 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 boom. And, my, and everything was just, and then I had to leave, right? And boom, and I open the door, and bing, I go in. I walked into the closet. Oh, that's <laughs> <laughs> so funny. In the producer's, here's the producer's office. I walked into the closet. <laughs> Try to be a tough guy coming out of that. Not oh, true. God. And they Let's were talk about you're they were a so dancer. You're, you're best known as an actor, and of course, you're a producer, but now you've, you've written the screenplay, or at least you uh, co wrote yeah. the screenplay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, we dancer. did story about Joey Ghirardella, the life of a middleweight champ of the world, Hall of Fame boxer who had a son with Down syndrome. And uh, you're involved in that now. And I'm, I wanted to know, uh, give an update, um, what's happening now that COVID's affected that as well? Well, it's interesting you asked, Charlie, because <laughs> uh, didn't you write a book? <laughs> oh, I did. It's called oh! Down and Never Out. Yes, I and, did. And what was it called? The biography of Joey Ghirardella. And what was it called? <laughs> Never mind. It's called Canvas Dancer. Now. <laughs> That's a much better title. He no. was a dancer, I'll tell you, as a boxer. If you watch, yeah, it, no, he was. And he look, really, I, uh, I I saw pictures of um, some of the boxers that he fought. And when you look at somebody like Dick Tiger, and you look at oh. uh, Hurricane Carter, man, they were so muscular. If they ever hit Joey, he would have gone down. But boy, he could slip a punch, and he, he was he was he was on the ball. It was inherent in him from the streets of Brooklyn. And then he got to South Philly because he was on the lam. And yes. he married this young girl, Rosalie, who I got to know her very well. I'm sure you did, too. Oh, I um, loved Rosalie. Yes. She was terrific. Your book was great. Um, Thank you. you're, you're welcome. And uh, the screenplay, um, you know, I wrote the original screenplay. Right. Then my wife came on okay. um, because... I guess if I do have one little slip up, uh, I don't, you know, write too well for women. And okay. she was also working with me on other parts of the script. Mm -hmm. And then Steve Talelli came on. Uh, he had written the script. Steve did. Yes, I know he had. And, he sent yeah. that to me and he also sent me Canvas Dancer in its last uh, version, I suppose. Oh, yeah. And the thing was, um, I didn't want to read his script because it would have flavored me or, or, yep. or maybe put me in another direction. But that turned out to be a mistake. That turned oh, out really? to be a mistake because I sort of dissed him on that, you know. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, like my wife says, and I, I'm getting better, I'm getting better. She says, Leo, it's very tough for you to play in the sandbox. <laughs> Because I've written by myself, and the guy that I that brought me in, Bobby Moresco, that won the Oscar for Crash, he would listen to me, and then he'd do just what he wanted, right? Yeah. So it's, but it's so much better. It's yes. so much better on so many levels. Um, things that I missed, that Lynn picked up, that Steve picked up, things that Steve wrote that were better than what than what I had. Good. But, um, it in the end. It is a powerful story. I believe the script works on a lot of different levels. 
Yeah. We're getting the budget done right now, and Good. then we're going to go out. And we're going to... Um, now, the money was put up by uh, Joey Giardello's nephew. Right. Who, yeah, he and Steve. Uh, and it's, it's, it's turning into a family affair, which it is... It is a family affair. Yeah. And uh, the producer on board, Vince Maggio, line producer, who's now the producer on this with me. And... Um, Look, I I think we're uh, we got a no pun intended. We got a puncher's chance. <laughs> I love it. Uh-huh. We well, need the director first before you go into a shooting script, right? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes. Um, we would like to simultaneously get the director and the lead actor to play Joey. You know. Um, yes, because, of course. Yeah. Yeah. That and, and if you make them a pay or play offer. That means if the movie's not made in 18 months, they get to keep 10% of the salary that's agreed upon, you know? But it, uh, and it just seems that young stars, they all want to do boxing movies. They want to do a box. There's usually one good one every other year, usually. Yeah. It's like uh, you you go from De Niro to Will Smith to, uh, oh, um, oh, there's so many of them that they just always like that's, and you know why? The vanity of an actor? Oh, I'll get in great shape. Oh, yes, I'll be yes. in good shape. Because <laughs> <You know? laughs> whenever you have to take your shirt off, that oh. is that gives you the impetus, you know? Yes. Yeah. Hey, Judy, we're going to have to call this a show. I think we're running into the magical time. I okay. think we are. Oh, Leo, thank you. This has been wonderful. Just wonderful. It's- you guys you made it again, Leo. Very we easy. always have a chop. You know, we'll have an opportunity to do this again sometime and get more into maybe canvas dancer as it progresses along. Without and also, a doubt. I want to promote your podcast to the to the walls. You know, I want well, to do that for you. I, I thank you for that, and uh, I'll keep you abreast. You may keep me abreast, and we'll be abreast. Ah, uh, right. sounds good. Thank All you. All right, thank you, team. Thank See you. Bye bye. 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 Charlie, do you have any uh, magical words for us, wisdom? I do. You know, I was, uh, you know, the other day we we um, we we lost Gail Sayers, a uh, football player from uh, from Chicago, and yeah. um, he said once, "I don't care to be remembered as the man who scored six touchdowns in a game. I want to be remembered as a winner in life." Oh. I love that. That's wonderful. Well, my quote is, um, never be afraid to try something new. Remember, amateurs built the ark. Professionals built the Titanic. (laughs) Unknown author. (laughs) Something to think about. Well, thanks for watching. I'm Judy Saxon. And I'm Charlie Redner. We'll see you the next time. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.